Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Kotchak. I'm the founder and CEO of Chemical Q Device, here to talk about explainable neuroimaging AI ML for FDA and prospective quantum machine learning. So as you can see, see here, the images on the left are FDGs, uh, which is uh, fluorodeoxyglucose um, uh, PET scans. And then the on the right is a deep neural network, or uh, some call it deep learning. And I'm going to go over uh, a little bit of timeline first. So this is talking about stage one, stage two. And then in specific, um, you have performance benefits, uh, prospective performance benefits with the quantum hardware. Now, there's also quantum memory, quantum sensing, but the, the talk will likely be in quantum computing with quantum sensing, quantum uh, memory, helping out the quantum computer in 2023. Now, as you can see, uh, prospectively better accuracy, potentially faster, uh, also may improve uh, with quantum hardware, the results as the computers uh, have more qubits and less error. And the forecast is pending and is, is subject to change, uh, prospective partnerships, funding, hires, and other related mechanisms likely need satisfied with this. And as you can see here in stage one is basically it's Alzheimer's, uh, a mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease, quantum machine learning prediction. Now, in all these things <clears throat> to start off, uh, and again, as I mentioned before, is, a, you know, needing kind of like the hires at this point um, of the forecast. But in 2023, qu quarter one, looking at collecting and preparing ADNI data. Um, so this is typically ADNI. Uh, one through three, which is the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging uh, initiative. Uh, so it's got a bunch of brain pictures with supplementary data as well. Choosing training and evaluating the mo model um, in Q1 in 2023 and in, in Q2, um, doing that as well. Now the parameter tu tuning and uh, making predictions, iteration, you know, you'll hear the, the word uh, hyperparameters, these types of things in Q3 of 2023. Um, minimum viable product MVP uh, expected in uh, 2023 uh, quarter three, and then a performance version of it. And again, this is synonymous with uh, the hardware getting better, the quantum computer uh, getting better uh, in 2024 quarter two. Now for FDA submission, it hasn't been, um, you don't see too many quantum standards out there. IEC, or sorry, IEEE quantum has nine. So you'll likely see this IEC, ISO, ASTM, uh, these types of standards uh, being required by FDA in the future and in, in putting a, a, a um, you know, date on that as 2025 quarter three. So um, this is basically a, a starting point for chemical Q device. And this is to, to work with uh, in synergy with a uh, stage two uh, algorithm, um, which is re reconstruction, which is more universal to getting better uh, brain images. And as I mentioned before, the forecast is pending a subject to change, prospective partnerships, funding, hire, hires, and other related mechanisms likely need to be satisfied as well. Now, in stage two, this is more, so if you look at medical imaging processing, um, this is the second big step. This, the first big step is basically acquiring. So say if you have like a future quantum sensor detection, that type of, type of stuff with raw data. So this reconstruction in medical images takes that data and then turns it into an image. And in doing so, you can improve things such as motion correction, uh, you can denoise, undersampling, you know, a mix of these different things. So basically the, the outlook for chemical Q device in this is basically 2023 quarter four, get started on it. And then, you know, choose train and evaluate model uh, through um, 2024, and then parameter tuning uh, 2024 quarter two, MVP uh, for this reconstruction algorithm, minimum viable product, 2024, quarter two. Uh, number five there, it says performance uh, algorithm, uh, 2025, uh, quarter two. And then a, a prospective FDA submission, you know, once these, uh, you know, governing bodies uh, have approvals for quantum hardware, quantum software, and then this works into the FDA submission for 2026, quarter three. Now, as I mentioned before, everything's dependent on the hardware at this point. We do have the National Science Foundation uh, forecast for 2023 practical quantum computer, which is helping things. 
And then also, so the future work is to combine with stage one of an Alzheimer's disease prediction algorithm. Um, does before forecast is subject to change but the perspective to partnerships uh, and so on and so forth, need satisfied. And then stage three, so this is looking at the next couple of years here, Alzheimer's disease prediction accelerated reconstruction. Um, so basically it's, it's combining two things. So this would fall under an FDA system. So such as, you know, you, there's hardware systems such as a portable MRI, um, or you also have, say, uh, a general, uh, general purpose ultrasound, those types of things where they're incorporating many things. So at this point, it's going to be software, um, but that's kind of how things are looking forward. And, you know, some the roadmap with this would be uh, bullet point two, 2024, uh, quarter three, uh, 2024, quarter four, um, you know, parameter tu tuning going to 2025 minimum viable product 2025 quarter four, a performance uh, algorithms, um, basically 2026 quarter three. And then you have stage four FDA submission as a system. Um, I didn't put a date on that. There's a couple working parts with that. So the important thing to notice with this is additional external resources may be required. Anytime you're talking about FDA submission for a system, it's a little bit more involved. And then um, in B at the bottom there, other image formation computing steps would remain constant. So I'll show you a little bit later that there's a, an a, array of other um, different, uh, you know, uh, segmentation, enhancement, visualization, those types of things, uh, but keeping basically the prediction algorithm for Alzheimer's. And then also with this reconstruction algorithm with, with quantum tech as well. Um, as with the other ones, forecast is pending and subject to change perspective to partnerships, fundings, hires, and other related mechanisms uh, likely need to be satisfied. Now, in all this, so you could see Alzheimer's disease uh, prognosis is made. Uh, it, okay, so what's going on is there was a breakthrough uh, device uh, in blood testing. Um, what's the number nine kind of thing? And the same thing could happen with quantum technologies as well. But it's kind of, uh, you know, introducing new variables uh, to PET scans, these types of things. So what has happened in light of this is the FDA, and these are a bunch of like medical imaging, um, you know, healthcare related organizations, CDER, CDRH, SNMMI, MITA, had a workshop in November 2022. So this is basically to keep, you know, imaging, uh, in my perspective, at the forefront of, you know, um, being used for clinical trials and, you know, a diagnosis, uh, prognosis, prediction, that kind of stuff. Now, number three here is basically a bunch of non-FDA approvals uh, in quantum. So as you can see, there's a fair amount of work that's been done. And my best uh, kind of um, explanation for it all is that the methods and frameworks have, have been laid uh, in analysis and everybody's waiting for a better quantum computer. So in 2023, that's what it looks like we're getting. But you'll see companies, you know, from Roche, QCWare, um, you'll see a bunch of these are, are for classification. So this is like, you know, if you have chest x-rays, is it non-viral, uh, viral, or you have COVID, like a tertiary um, classification. And then say, for instance, in, um, you know, these QML studies, the closest one is this auto detection of Alzheimer's disease via hybrid quantum neural networks by uh, Shawar et al. earlier this year. And it's basically classifies, uh, you know, inserting uh, um, QML or quantum machine learning into certain spots using quantum um, as hybrids um, to get either you have Alzheimer's disease or don't. And like I said, there's a number of these COVID-19 classification and then in F you'll see classification and, and segmentation. So a little bit early as far as, you know, things settling down and, and things getting, you know, approved by the FDA. Um, uh, but basically the, the wheels have been in motion say the last year and a half with quantum machine learning and healthcare. Now in stage two, the precedence has been, um, I reviewed the last 10 FDA approvals for software's medical device. Now this would uh, count more as a 
Uh, so a CT deep, deep learning in A for GE health healthcare, and this could be for head, meaning brain or uh, full body or lung, those types of things. But these are a recent reconstruction, reconstructive imaging approval. So hyperfine, I mentioned this one before, the portable MRI uses deep learning. So a couple of years ago, FDA approval for uh, you know, complex algorithms, comp continuously learning uh, what was not clear if you get approval. And here we are, here's a couple of them in July of, the, of two, 2022. And the basis in quantum is Seth Lloyd, uh, MIT. He's done a paper, Quantum Machine Learning Reconstruction Algorithms. Um, and he's this has been built up over the years, but there's been so much research as far as, you know, out quantum algorithms optimizing circuits and now you know cutting circuits into pieces called dynamic circuits um, that a lot of this, this framework is is going to go bode well in healthcare in my opinion so in stage three some of the precedences so these are the more uh systems so here are your ultrasound the portal portable mri so they're encompassing many different uh standards between say astm if it's physical something like a nema like an electronic enclosure so the, the breakthrough device potential for quantum to me is, is warranted. Um, you have, so basically it's the principles of superpositioning and, and entanglement. So when you have quantum bits is basically when you negate the noise as, as we're doing and increase qubits or quantum bits is that you have the, you know, more and more chances to uh, get, we're, we call it quantum advantage for combinatorial problems and many variables. And this can include big data. And I mentioned this, the NSF, um, you know, forecast in 2023 for a practical quantum computer. Uh, and also, you know, you need quantum sensing, quantum memory to help a lot of these quantum computers as well. Now, you'll hear this term a lot is basically, you'll keep a lot of the, the software um, basically uh, conventional or classical, but with quantum transfer learning, say for instance, for hyperparameters, you're running on some form of quantum uh, hardware or a quantum simulator. And this includes graph theory, number theories, and statistics. For, um, and all of this basically for improved speed scale for problems that can run quantum mechanics and uh, quality forecasts. Uh, so you could look at IBM's roadmap that kind of uh, shows where things are going. And this allows for sophisticated control uh, algorithm uh, compilation for next year as well. So these are a bunch of the literature reviews. Uh, explainable AI, a John, big John, Johns Hopkins review, uh, Alzheimer's and, and explainable AI uh, with certain types of algorithms. The ADNI, so this is all Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging uh, initiative, had bold, bold challenges, very interesting. Uh, basically, researchers going off against each other, then improving after the first year. And this, you'll see with the SHAP, uh, and I'll give you the acronym a little bit later, interpretability. So you want algorithms to start off with uh, end users, meaning physicians, nurses, and so on and so forth, in mind before you start making awesome algorithms that can't be understood later. And then the directions with QML, a couple of websites uh, that, that focus on this. Um, in this kind of like healthcare QML era that we're going into. So this is the first paper, explainable medical imaging AI means human-centered design gu guidelines and evidence from systematic review. So this is John Hopkins paper. They're one of the top research universities in the US. And basically that's, you'll see, I saw a DARPA, you know, this uh, basically you want trustworthy AI, explainable AI. You know, basically this is, is says, you know, at the end of it, can you understand the results? <laughs> so in all these uh, human machine learning teams, um, and there's two different approaches. The first one is like basically just uh, programming and coding up front with uh, less regards to um, being able to understand it. And the second one, which is harder uh, because you have to uh, in, uh, figure more factors into it is basically getting transparency in algorithms. So here's basically the, the flow of all this. Uh, they call it the interpret guideline. So formative research is, is known as you're, you know, you, you're talking to your end users and this iterative process, meaning that you're handing over algorithms um, that continuously get better. Uh, development, ideation, development, and validation. So these go uh, back and forth, right? 
But I kind of see this as being like, you know, a new standard of things coming through. Um, so basically you have design choices you need to consider. And then basically there's a lot of wasted time you could do if you don't do these uh, steps correctly. So this is basically target audience, uh, design choices. And they said five key dimensions, functional, operational, usability, safety, and validation. So this is basically like the FDA wants transparencies. You know, everybody wants to have algorithms, although they're complex, they're more understandable. Um, so this is likely a big trend coming up in healthcare, um, leaving from just medical papers into, you know, being used. So this is basically, uh, I mentioned this is rapid prototyping with users, this is, you know, physicians, nurses, so on and so forth. There's different barriers because you have programmers. So say for instance, you know, there's knowledge mis mismatch between people who code, you know, in the medical field uh, and what's important in, in, in one is may, may not be as uh, understood in another. Uh, availability restrictions or ethical concerns exist, right? Because there's patient data, and uh, you know that that needs security as well. Um, so there's uh, this complex na nature of medical da data anyway. So there, th what they say is this kind of goes back to that flow chart is, is basically having a formative user research, um, and then more of an empirical studies. Um, so basically, you know, working closely with all these different groups to design algorithms, um, and then. Of the ones that they uh, reviewed, the 68, none of them introduced formative user research. Again, this is very hard. You know, it's, it's basically taking two worlds and combining between uh, coders, programmers, and then say, for instance, the, um, you know, what, what will be the end result? What will a doctor get out of an algorithm? And as you can see, there's some that uh, chose clinical priors, you know, things that have pre-existed in guidelines. And, um, you know, so basically, uh, this is, for instance, segmentation. So segmentation is, um, you know, typically done non-transparent. So on the top is that approach, and on the bottom is basically you have these different, uh, you know, uh, clinical knowledge, shape prior, saliency map, understanding. And then I'll I'll go over this, um, you know, towards the end again, and then I'll have time for questions. Um, just get through this uh, towards the the later slides. Now, here's what they say is basically interpret, incorporation, interpretability, target, reporting, prior, and task. And like I said, this is one of the big, biggest research uh, organizations out there, uh, Johns Hopkins. And basically, they go through these different steps of, you know, interpretability, reporting. Um, and they, after the fact, you know, they said that nobody followed their scheme uh, because, <laughs> You know, now they're saying what needs to be done. And that's typical of a review is you can't have a review with a bunch of other, without having these findings. And this is the kind of like that more iterative process between end user requirement, and clinical scenario. And to get a uh, transparency, you can use attention mechanisms, human understandable features, uh, combination of uh, deep learning and transparent and so on and forth and so forth. But these, this kind of gives you a, like a look into what you know will likely be focused. And again, I've seen it in other government organizations as far as understanding algorithms. And uh, so this goes through a bunch of these. So basically more in detail of attention mechanisms, human understandable features, decision trees, uh, so on and so forth. And then in specific in this one, uh, basically getting transparency, Easy to understand illustrations, um, you know, visualizing uh, gradient-based importance, so on and so forth. And then you have uh, feature-based directly analyzing encoded feature. Now, in the second paper here, this is in-depth in insights into Alzheimer's disease by using explainable machine learning approach. This is basically incorporating Alzheimer's into XAI or explainable AI, and basically what they're saying is this XG boost algorithm uh, for hyperparameters tuning. And by the way, hyperparameters tuning is, is something that quantum is, is being used for as well. And will likely, you know, start to enter in. And I mentioned this before, Shapley transparency values. It's kind of, it's basically the standard in um, understandable, explainable AIs. So in all these, um, you know, basically you can have a physician that does everything on their own with clinical history of patients uh, with similar uh, brain scans, 
You can have regression based on MRI cognitive uh, scores. You can have supervised machine learning, uh, data-driven disease progression in vitro unsupervised. So as we go further, further into this, and especially as quantum becomes more of a consideration in the hardware aspect, that um, you know, you'll see more of these kind of pan out than others. So there's things working against age. So as you as we age, um, your chances of getting Alzheimer's doubles every five years after 65. The APOE4 is uh, basically blood tests, so 10 to 30 times higher if you have it. Gender, um, you know, obviously there's differences here. And then medical conditions, uh, basically if you have any other ones and lifestyle factors can contribute to a, an Alzheimer's disease um, uh, diagnosis. So they have these four hypotheses. So I'm gonna not spoil it until the end, but basically, you know, they're not tough, but I'll show you the charts and I'll, I'll show you if they were able to meet them. Um, so basically hypothesis, scientific method is, is what we're talking about here. So they split it up, up to, so usually you'll have like a tertiary, so cognitive uh, uh, normal uh, CN, MCI and AD, and here they have an early uh, mild cognitive and significant memory uh, concerns. So there's five uh, categories here. And basically, you know, you go through these different phases, data set analysis, pre-processing, uh, you train, so XG boost is what they're looking at. And then every time you hear interpretability, figure SHAP values, Shapley values. And then they have conclusions and then they test at the end with uh, phase six. And here's kind of the, the flow of it all, uh, the workflow is phase one, two, three, four, five. And this is uh, data analysis that goes, you know, just what I explained there. And basically it's an iterative uh, process, um, but keep in mind, there's still no treatment for Alzheimer's disease. There's ways of improving it with uh, pharmaceuticals and so forth, obviously with testing, with uh, neuroimaging and even uh, blood work. And the tadpole, tadpole challenge is this ADNI. So it's an ADNI initiative and it's basically Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging uh, initiative. And it's basically, there's three big group, groups here um, that have looked at it. Uh, so, you know, over 12,000 features. So this is, uh, you know, with ADNI data. Um, and basically there's, uh, you know, FDG, MRI, mid temp. So the MRI, um, is you, there's three tests. Uh, the first one, FDG PET, is just a single one, and I'll show you in the subsequent ones. And in number five, I'll address again towards the end because there's uh, more diversity uh, coming in through a new ADNI 4. And then this is the heat map. So basically, you know, the, the more blue, the more corresponded. And basically, you know, you have age at the top, uh, gender, you have APO, APOE4, uh, which is blood, and then FDG, which is uh, more like a, a neuroimaging as well. And then at the bottom, um, it's the same thing. So it's basically how, how they correlate with these things. And uh, this is kind of what they wanted. They wanted an even distribution between cognitively normal, all of the MCIs and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so that's a good representation. And when you have these confusion matrix is you want a diagonal like that. So the ones that say like 90 at the bottom aren't quite as good and the 69, 78, but typically if you're on that, that line, um, you know, you're doing pretty good. So their algorithm is XG boost uh, classification is basically for all these different ones. Um, you could look at precision on the left for cognitively normal all the way down to say Alzheimer's disease, you know, 86% and then with a high of the SMC at, at uh, 94. Um, and then likewise comparison, actually this is different. So XG boost classifier, which is one algorithm versus which is theirs and then random forest classifier. So they're showing that their classifier is better than the random forest. Random forest is a, like a general, general usage. And then in all these things, you have input parameters. So basically the CDRSB is, um, it's more kind of like uh, the paperwork behind it all, age. And then you can see FDG, whole brain, hippocampus. But this is basically saying what has the greatest interpretability out, out of it all. So with a CDRSB more, being more uh, interpretable in this study. And this is Venn diagram. So you can see MMSC, um, uh, whole brain, CDRSB, age, uh, FDG, a little bit off, and then hippocampus, which is MRI, 
Um, so they go over in great detail. So this is heavily uh, summarized. Now, I think this is basically the crux of their findings is, and I'll get to their hip hypothesis of their four you know, things that they are trying to prove, um, is basically in all these things is you want positive shap values. So you want to be the bigger bul bulges on the right of the zero. And as you can see, and many of these is you get some of that, but say for instance, a lot of the, the interpretability, you know, using their methods, you know, I would tend to be negative or, or less interpretable. And then here's uh, kind of features influence on it all. So this is basically the CDRS, you know, is basically, you know, having these features, uh, you know, more important in this. And then you see MMSC and FDG, FDG is more of like a brain scan in it all. And you see age uh, more towards the bottom. So basically that's what they found is their XG boost required less feature engineering. Um, and then, but it also requires more time. And then most of the researchers that used the ADNI uh, data sets for Tadpole had an accuracy over uh, 0.9, which is uh, good. And then this is basically, this is the ADNI Tadpole versus their model. So Frog is the best ADNI Tadpole, um, you know, and you could look at it from uh, uh, basically, uh, let's see, BCA, I think is what they look at. Um, but basically, in the second one, RXGB model, meaning the authors, 0.842, and then the be benchmark SVM uh, goes down, small heads and, and rocket. Um, so basically, this is the author's, uh, basically, contributions to it all. And some of these things I've kind of highlighted before, but it's just a very specific thing, because when you go through these papers, there's many diagrams, and then you have to see, you know, what each one means. But basically, a unique combination of MRI and the indicators influence for each of the diagnosis may be interesting to physicians, right? So, and some of these, if it shows that neuroimaging isn't quite as uh, a big a factor than others, um, that's, you know, this, it's a, it's a, you have to focus on, you know, what they're trying to say in all these. Um, but that's what they uh, claimed. And I goes, I think it goes back to this violin plot in number six is all the uh, hypotheses were rejected due to uh, Alzheimer's disease complexity. In other words, this is a work in progress kind of paper, um, but it's good to be honest as well. So in this paper, explainable AI toward understanding the performance of the top three tadpole challenge methods uh, in the forecast of Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So in this specific one, so this Hernandez, uh, that, uh, Hernandez uh, et al, the purpose is to look at these more closely, right? Because there's this hu these huge challenges out there and it's gonna uh, go through with SHAT values or interpretability. So if you, you know, leave with one thing, that's basically that, that, that um, it's part of explainable AI. So SHAP is being used. And in all these uh, tadpole and prognosis, you look at clinical status, cognitive de uh, decline, ventricle at atrophy over five years. So here's the winner. So in a different paper, we saw uh, frog. The second one is three days. And the third one is the SVM or um, the support vector machine third place. And they use different uh, techniques. So, you know, and they, these are kind of relating uh, papers as well, but you, permutation based importance. I'm gonna focus more on the tadpole with all these, but figure more at L and Nguyen at L kind of uh, having good, uh, influences uh, as well. Now this Elsa Bog paper is outside Tadpole and they use it, um, you know, basically random forest, multi-layer, multimodal detection and prediction. So they spoke, the authors spoke high of this. And then also, you know, as you go down, uh, you know, um, we're gonna look at in four divisions, clinical history, cognitive features, APOE4 imaging. So you'll start to see a lot of these uh, kind of features uh, keep popping up again, you know, especially with neuroimaging, uh, cere cerebral spinal fluid. And this is a summary of the three. So uh, this is frog, the winner, gradient boosting. And it goes through exact exactly what gradient bo boosting is. And one year later, after they won, 70 features from the original data um, augmented for 420. So in number two, random forest. And then a year later, it tells you what they did. And then number three, EMC, EB, support vector machine, 200 features. So maybe they're, you know, improving 
at a higher rate than the others because they were in third place. So here's some of the data. So this is MAUC, so multi-dimensional area under the curve. So you have frog three days, EMCB, and this is the top uh, row, uh, you know, several rows is what's to be looked at is that's basically their, their findings, you know, for these papers. And then, you know, some of the, the uh, lesser performing are in the, the subsequent rows as well. And as you can see here, the biggest thing for interpretability is diagnosis. Um, and CDRSB, we saw in a different paper. And then this goes, you know, all the way down. So, um, you know, basically, it's interesting because you see some, some of these effects, and then they're basically saying in the, in the top case, in Alzheimer's disease, wasn't quite as interpretable as the cognitively normal versus MCI or mildly cognitive impairment. And then they go through, so they're saying FDG was identified as a relevant feature. Um, and then your more of your MRI, PET, DTI mar, uh, biomarkers, um, you know, they're saying to focus on those as opposed to some of the cognitive information. So cognitive tests typically do very well um, compared, you know, in interpretability versus some of these others. So, and you can see that, um, you know, everything has limitations though, and that's why we need validations in, in different areas. And diagnosis is the most significant feature. So basically looking at all these, their algorithm, um, they're saying was most important uh, due to cognitive features with MRI or neuroimaging. Um, for random forest, it's mostly cognitive, and then SVMs, cognitive features highly interleaved with in imaging features. And what's important with this is you see limitations. So these papers, a lot of them aren't perfect and they're wiles away from FDA submission. So uh, in XAI and especially, you know, complex algorithms, you know, many patients, these types of things. So they basically in their future work, they wanna further explore SHAP, so interpretability. Uh, causability and actionability, um, and then also replace image-based features with original images. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so basically, there's I I I not quite sh I don't think this is a compression thing, but basically getting more information with original data is what what they're going for there. And then in this space, uh, uh, basically this paper, so a robust framework for uh, to in investigate the reliability and save stability of explainable AI of MCI and Alzheimer's disease, and you know, basically tertiary classification. Uh, and here we go, we're back at SHAP. So SHAP, you know, interpretability. And in the last two decades, you, you, we've seen an exponential growth in high performing machine learning applications. And then you'll see, you know, for A, supervised un unsupervised methods uh, being used to predict the risk of conversion. And I'm gonna focus on the results here uh, mostly, but basically there's other, uh, such as this European Commission um, that have helped with uh, explainable AI, which is either intrinsic, which is interpretable due to internal structure or post hoc, which is uh, after being trained. And then the main aims here is basically, uh, you know, one through four with it being examined longitudinal variations of XAI for cognitive indexes is their main goal. And then you can see that they have a hypothesis that the explainable, actually, this is really important. So explainability ind indexes could be considered uh, markers for patient neurodegenerative uh, patterns. So the very fact that you have explainability uh, it, it, like if you have a blood biomarker or neuroimaging or CSF, is that's that's kind of where they're going with it. And then this is basically their workflow uh, proposed analysis. Um, so you'll see common things such so train R random forest tuning parameters, you know, final RF model, and then SHAP. So basically, they want to use SHAP as a as a marker, um, the interpretability of, of it all. So basically, you know, you have uh, their end point here is basically identify potential subgroups and by RF classes. So you'll see that this is a random forest SHAP paper. It's a random forest for the algorithm that overcomes multicollinearity, and then SHAP, um, either intrinsic or extrinsic, achieves to explain the internals of RF uh, classifier train. And 
To do this, they use an inner loop, outer loop. So here we go, hyperparameters again. This is the second, third time mentioned. This is the type of stuff you know for quantum going into. Outer loop evaluating a uh, train model with selected uh, parameters. And then you can see the area under the curve, 0.97, which is very good. Um, and then also there are 10 features and it just depends on what you're looking at. Uh, accuracy of 70% area under the curve of 0.89. Now, the accuracy specificity sensitivity. So most of us know what accuracy specificity is basically how well it's distinguished from uh, the thing that you're not trying to go for. And then sensitivity is more towards, you know, going uh, what you are going for. So you can see this is uh, these are their findings. Confusion matrix is is pretty good. So they put it in yellow. So you always look at the surrounding squares. So a 606, 630. You know, kind of getting up there 20% um, for some of these, uh, the performances of the matrix. And then also, um, you know, this is basically area under the curve uh, for Alzheimer's disease in red, uh, basically the true, true, true positive rate, basically. So this would be your, um, you know, accurate or uh, sensitivity kind of thing. So Alzheimer's disease being best in that case. And then this is, these are SHAPs. So the way that SHAPs are, are, this is the end result of after you're running your algorithm with interpretability is uh, with uh, cosine distances. So you can see that certain ones, so say for instance, purple AD, AD had the, you know, these error bars are large, but uh, had some of the, um, you know, larger cosine distances, which is uh, preferable. Now, there are some limitations with this is basically, you know, their assessment represents a preliminary step for clinical diagnosis. Other exams and neuroimaging data may largely improve. Um, basically, it seems like a lot of these things are here to stay, you know, even if there's a breakthrough in, in blood work. And then, you know, now we have this huge conference, you know, uh, for PET scans, uh, you know, for prognosis as well. And uh, they're basically saying their results can be increased with MEG, which is the magnetic equivalent of EEG, uh, PET scans, MRIs, so on and so forth, and to examine XAI resulting from neuroimaging uh, classifications or future. And um, you see, so some of the other findings, you know, they say in line with uh, the current 2018 uh, research. Now I'm going to switch over to QML. So QML is quantum machine learning. So this is basically um, going to be, and it already is uh, in the quantum world, so not mainstream. But when we're talking about this, we're talking about Penny Lane, we're talking about IBM. And um, there's this is actually a medium post, and I found it quite useful. So say, for instance, it's their beginner's guide. So they walk through, and this is the code. So you have to know how to do all this stuff. So this is install the necessary libraries and dependencies. So you'll see install Penny Lane, which is synonymous with uh, QML, but you can do it on, on uh, Qiskit as well, which is IBM. Install NumPy, uh, Matplot, uh, Lib. So this is what uh, Chemical Cube device is gonna go into more and uh, perhaps maybe um, you know people that have done this a little bit, but it's a good launch point for a lot of us to learn. So this is how, you know, you know, the next wave of programming on quantum hardware uh, for quantum machine learning. So number two, load the sample data set. So in coding, uh, three, four, five, and six also have lines of code. I just abbreviated this. And then you'll see some of the players here. So in 54, we looked at NumPy. Um, in the, another diagram here, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Penny Lane is kind of like, you know, it seems I've seen at least, I think five or six. And you're seeing, MVP like minimum viable product like results, you know, using Penny Lane on a, a quantum simulator, which is on a, a classical computer, but, you know, doing uh, quantum mechanics. And likewise, you'll hear Kiskit a lot. Uh, Rick Eddy's doing QML and kind of medical imaging as well. And then they say train the uh, quantum uh, model. So here's the code for that. And then um, this is reference 53 if you want to look uh, basically to see. Uh, it, it's their, their site that they have this. Evaluate the quantum model, visualize the results, and then obtain results. So this will be the thing. A lot of times you don't get what you want because the code's not right. So if you haven't heard of Quantum Algorithm Zoo, I recommend checking it out. So this has been around for a while. Now, the gentleman, um, uh, Stephen uh, Jordan, 
he created this in say April 2011. And then I think he did it for over 10 years. He took a little break and then he just got started back on it uh, in October of this year. So this is basically the nuts and bolts. Uh, you know, basically when you're looking at two fields of combining medical data and quantum algorithms, you know, you're trying to figure out which types. So he uh, splits them into pieces and it's basically an articles listing. It's uh, in a more, uh, you know, narrow uh, approach than say your uh, Google Scholar, but this is all for quantum algorithms. So it's helpful. Now the supplementary, um, so basically this is basically health information moves in a cynical, uh, uh, cyclical pattern. So you'll see the hospital, you know, all these different, so your genomics, imaging. So these, a lot of these things, and we're talking multimodal, you know, so if you're imaging plus genomics plus electronic health records, and then basically your AI kind of transformations at the bottom here, but it, it basically, it's an iterative process and it improves over time. Um, so this is basically Alzheimer's disease had the most, uh, in the specific review, this Northwestern Cornell Case Western, the most papers in purple there. And then likewise, fusion strategies were the largest for MCI and AD. So how you read this is basically the inner circle is the type of fusion. So most fusion or most uh, multimodalness is early, and then you can have joint or late. And it, as you can see, early is the biggest. So I focused on that. And then if you look at diagnosis, MCI and AD are the primary factors. If you look at prediction, AD or Alzheimer's diseases as well. Now, this is basically it, right? Because certain components are gonna run. So this, this is the paper that does a binary classification, non-AD or Alzheimer's disease, and then runs a specific part on this quantum variational circuit on a quantum simulator. And they said their results improved from say 92% to 97%. So this is quantum code is what I'm trying to say. And other parts will remain classical, but the things that will can be done better on quantum, you have to program using the staff notation is what they said, or other, other means. And basically there's a lot of driving forces between IBM Cleveland Clinic, NYU Langone, Fermilab, uh, this National Institute for Quantum Science and Tech, Mount Sinai Hospital and National Science Foundation for Chemical Q Device. We look for, uh, you know, the startup looks for uh, progressive hospitals say. Now this is available for download. So this is a more traditional pitch deck. So problem, solution, uh, market opportunity, uh, technology. And uh, you know, the, the rationale be between a lot of this is healthcare data is 30% of all, all data with a compound annual growth rate of 36%. Now imaging data accounts for 90% of all of that data um, with over 5.5 billion global imaging procedures per year. And then the global AI, so this is more like the uh, artificial component of it, has a 45% company inner growth rate, according to uh, Yahoo Report Linker, with the biggest component being neurology. So not only AD, Alzheimer's disease, biocognitive impairment, but things like stroke, um, Parkinson's, those other ones. So favorable. And then obviously looking towards licensing subscriptions and partnerships with organizations that do good and well. And then this is actually, this is adapted from Sabaya uh, G et al. Um, their paper is called Hybrid Quantum Transfer, uh, or it's similar to that. It's, it's basically hybrid quantum transfer using, in, in the case of say the stage one that I, I mentioned before with, uh, you know, ADNI databases to train off of and the specific uh, patient data. And you'll see in here, it says PyTorch, PennyLane, so those are the kind of like the big quantum platforms. And then you'll see, you know, the simulator, which is more penny lane, and then the real hardware, uh, which is more this IBM in this case. But there's a bunch of papers besides the one, the QML paper that I referenced several times of the, you know, binary classification, non-Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's. And then in specific, conventional AI and ML has done many, many papers in prediction. So this is, the basis for that is there's nine, at least nine in 2021. So they, these can be either be like your healthy subject uh, MCI or, or myocognitive impairment to uh, Alzheimer's. Now I highlighted this because basically I've shown this a couple times and in reconstruction, so this is basically the stage uh, two uh, 
uh, product for chemical Q device. So, you know, I'm going to focus on that. So data-driven learning, so bigger machine learning, uh, model, which is older, plus data-driven, accelerated reconstruction, which is, you know, basically what the startup's looking at, motion corrections, denoising. So this is if you have an MRI that's noisy, denoise it, or you have the motion correction with the kids that not sitting still, those types of things. So reconstruction is a huge thing in medical image processing, and that's where uh, startups going to be focused in, in stage two. So the market opportunity for all of this is basically um, in Alzheimer's, uh, basically in clinical trials surrounding uh, Alzheimer's disease, i.e. the drugs that want to go to market, is that they want better brain images. So now things are standard, you know, but likely as, as things progress as, you know, say, oh, there's a better quantum sensor, right? And this quantum sensor can be used with a chemical Q device, you know, quantum algorithm, those types of things. And, you know, so basically there's, I've done other research on this, but, you know, say if you had Eli Lilly and Roche, um, you know, these big pharmaceuticals, and they're highly dependent on MRI and, and PET scans. Uh, and basically, you know, the more resolution sensitivity, the better. And here's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four of chemical Q device. So this is basically stage one is for uh, better prediction. And B, stage two is for, you know, creating better brain images, you know, starting with image uh, reconstruction um, and then keeping everything else the same. So only changing one thing at a time in medical image processing. And C, I highlighted this with stage three, this combinatory work, and then in D, uh, potential FDA submissions. And this is the, the mission statement, which hasn't changed much, which is to improve neuroimaging techniques utilizing quantum technologies for better sensitivity, signal strength, and or resolution combined with advanced prediction in neuroradiology for Alzheimer's disease. Here's some of the competitors. So the one I want to highlight is Rigetti Strange Works. They're the first kind of like uh, you know, in quantum, R Rigetti is a quantum hardware manufacturer. Uh, Strangeworks is more software, um, but bigger, they do multiple things. And, uh, you know, some of these, uh, Meredith is huge. It's a, the IBM uh, Watson Health, you know, 1,400 uh, employees in the upper left. So there are likely to be going to be entering the market. It's just, you know, there's learning curves, you know, learning with quantum and programming and specific. So it'll be interesting, but figure, you know, there, there can be competition, but more than likely it's partnerships because everything's more specific, you know. And here's in general what's happening in quantum uh, healthcare. So most of these are, you know, besides the ones that I mentioned in medical imaging. So, you know, the Roche and the, you know, uh, Rigetti and QC or, yeah, QCWare and Strangeworks, these are more focused on drug discovery. So you might have heard of Polaris QB if you've attended before. Uh, Minton AI is in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Janssen, um, you know, which is uh, Johnson Johnson Pharmaceuticals. Uh, but yes, there are efforts in drug discovery as well. And this is basically an outline of, if somewhere in, say, for instance, like uh, one of the governing regulatory bodies were to say, oh, okay, what do we need to, you know, focus on to, you know, to standardize? And IEEE Quantum has, a, has addressed some, of, some, if not many of these. Now, these are a bunch of the FDA recent approvals. Um, so again, I took a look even to the previous 10 and didn't find too much in my specific area, but two, I think two or three, I know two of these are uh, deep learning reconstruction. Two of these are the full systems, you know, say with an algorithm that does CT or an algorithm that does, um, you know, uh, reconstruction in, in a portable MRI or ultrasound, you know, so we're talking GE medical systems, you know, some big companies in here. Now, here's an abbreviated uh, view of the mechanism between Alzheimer's disease. When you hear me say like amyloid beta or PET or uh, amyloid beta PET or tau PET, you know, PET being the scan or the heart, you know, um, you know, basically there's a lot of focus and understanding what's going on. Here's a bunch of the Alzheimer's organizations to look at. And I included, this is a new slide. So, you know, Alzheimer's Association published this. Uh, the first thing, in 2021, $270 billion uh, worth of caregiver hours towards the disease. The second one, 
$320 billion in 2022 in US costs for Alzheimer's and, and uh, related dementias. One in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's and dementias. And then over 6 million Americans currently live with Alzheimer's. They say in 2050, uh, nearly uh, $1 trillion will go towards Alzheimer's uh, dementias, representing 13 million Americans. Um, it's a huge thing. So they say this is quantum machine learning. Neuroimaging for Alzheimer's disease is the approach with all this. Now, here's the, the more of the breaking news, the ADNI4. So on their website, they didn't list you know, if they got funding again, and it seems like the funding is more favorable. And it's also more favorable to, uh, uh, you know, diverse uh, patients uh, that will be scanned with this. So they say five-year extension of the study. They've had three previous ones, and this is, you know, $147 million. So a lot is going into this. And the clinicaltrials.gov focuses on, um, or that clinical trials is all imaging. You know, there's six different PETs, PET scans, you know, types, 1,500 particip participants in that as well. So um, I'd love to hear from a number of people here. And uh, let's see here. We've got, uh, you know, more people coming on here. So you should be able to, uh, you can talk. So yeah, you could come on or, uh, you can put video as well. And then in the chat, yes, the recordings will be available. <laughs> and if I get a break here, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, yes, uh, do we still need it? Okay, so the way that works, VJ. Uh, so the question is, in general, AI models improve with continuous learning from feedback data. Do we still need FDA approval whenever you retrain a model? So there, there's a whole thing in, in place with that. Um, so basically there's these uh, two terms that they use. And number one, your organizational has to be, uh, your organization has to be excellent in the way that it's, it's dealing with uh, not only getting the algorithm up, but then how it will update it. So if you do an FDA search, and I forget the two terms, but the, they, they use a couple of terms. And then, Bahar, if you have anything. But yeah, they use a couple of terms. Um, and it, it's the whole process of retraining and continuously learning, these types of things. Um, but figure a lot of this, you're fully in investigated by the FDA. Um, and then VJ also asks, does it uh, use a lot of the synthetic or augmented? That's the whole thing. So, v so basically... There's this uh, world out there called uh, generative adversarial networks. So those say use 10% real data and 90% noise. And then over the course of time of training this data off of what's real and what's not, eventually it can't tell on its own if it just saw, if it just uh, evaluated uh, or discriminated a, a, a real image or a fake image. So, Obviously, that has huge implications in medical because medical is short relatively on data. And the more um, images, say if you have, you know, you only put in 10 and then now you're getting like nine or 10 out, something like that or more. Um, but the whole thing is trust, right? Like, can you trust it? Can you explain it? Because if you're generating fake images and your discriminator now can't tell the difference between a real and a fake, is that good or bad? You know, so some might say, well, yeah, the end result is, but can you prove it? So this kind of, if you come across a, a GAN paper, generative adversarial network paper, XAI, explainable AI, I'd like to see it, <laughs> but it's a pretty hard thing to do. So I, I don't know as far as the exact time of, of when we'll start to see GANs and healthcare um, get approved, you know, those types of things. So, yeah, those are two really good questions. Um, does anybody else have an, uh, another question? Um, hey, sorry, did I interrupt you? I was, no, go ahead. Um, uh, 
I think the last part that you were talking about having diverse data for me it um, it it can also mean diverse in terms of genetics or different races actually. So um, I don't know if you have noticed the model would change if you change drastically if you use for instance for this group of people versus the other group of people. So you need to tweak something for each um, race. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not positive, but I think they account for that. So in ADNI 4 is, is the last slide I was talking about, and that, that's what Bahar's talking about, is that they're saying at least 50% are going to be for minority populations, um, you know, 50 to 60%. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some interplay, because I, I knew, that, I think they do interplay pretty well between ADNI 1, 2, 3, and then say, for instance, this has kind of been long overdue because as you saw in one of these studies, it was like, I don't know, like 94, 90, 95% non-minorities. So, and there's an, I think there's a government news, I don't know if you've heard of that too, uh, Bahar, is that, you know, there's a bunch of funding in to get, you know, minority, you know, all these brain scans as well. Yeah, it's, it's good to add, uh, like, Combine everything is pretty, it's very good to have data from minority, but I'm saying maybe at this time we need to separate them. Then we will have more, like a fit, more fitted data for each group instead of having um, a loose model that works for both cases, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't under, I, 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 me personally, I don't know the whole entire process, but on that last article, I, I, so there's two things. There's on clinicaltrials.gov, there's ADNI4, there's Alzheimer's Association, ADNI4. Um, but, you know, I, I think some of these things may be accounted for, but I, you could further investigate at those uh, two or more links. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually interested in knowing how much politics has impacted um, this, this type of medical. I mean, it, I mean, separating them is really something that um, they, they have considered and they found no use in it or they don't want to talk about it for political reasons. That's more I'm um, curious about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you have anything else, Bahar? No, thank you. And then anybody that we haven't heard from? We had a, a Gervais, you're free to come on. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jervis, uh, I'm from Chicago. I, I just, this is the first meeting uh, I'm going to attend and, uh, but I came late, so sorry about that. But next time I will be on time. And uh, so I have no question, but uh, what I would like, if you can send me a recorded video of these events or some material I can read so that next time I can be on the same line with the others. That would be great. Yeah, glad to have you on. Um, and then without knowing where everybody's coming from, does anybody have anything um, medically in specific they want to talk about? And then um, here's the link. So I'm putting the link to the videos in the chat. <clears throat> so all the decks are on the website. So if you go to chemicalqdevice.com, um, it'll say recent neuroimaging decks and uh, at the top or towards the top. So yeah, it's definitely, it's an ongoing thing, you know, with the uh, healthcare and quantum, but it seems, you know, like it's a pretty valid approach in these big companies, you know, Roche and IBM and uh, you know, well, in quantum world, it's QCWare, Rigetti, um, Strangeworks, those those types of things. But the whole the whole crux of this is you have programs, and say at this point you're still running on conventional hardware, and then the next step of your program you'll run on a quantum computer, right? And then so the whole interplay there is called hybrid, right? So <clears throat> hybrid QML, you'll you'll see all different things and you know in specific a lot of these are considered transfer learning where you're doing the training on you know previous data with classical and then at the end for fine tuning you might use a quantum computer with quantum machine learning uh, for hyperparameters so 
Yeah, that's the thing. And with all this, you know, with emerging technologies, it'll take time. Um, and especially like, because there's five or six different types of quantum hardware technologies. So say for instance, well, you know, which which will pan out, which are acceptable. I would say the ion trap technology um, is the most published in literature as far as having uh, kind of like conclusive results. And I don't know if you guys know Quantum with Anna. She's uh, uh, Chicago. Yes, and, I know. Yeah, so she said she just ran on, say, like a superconducting qubit IBM with like 20-something percent or 30-something percent. And then safe with the ion traps, you got 97%. So as far as the one kind of being ready, the most ready at, at this moment, it would be ion trap, even though it's not theoretically as powerful as gate-based superconducting. But say, so some of these are the, the <clears throat> you know, likely the topics of interest at these meetings that they have. Um, you know, I'd say like an IEC or ISO or ASTM or even NEMA. So... Yeah, it'll all be developing for sure. But I, I think the, the principle right now is the National Science Foundation got into quantum funding it in early 1980s. And they said, I think it was last year, that in 2023, we will have a practical quantum computer. Now, will that be first quarter, second quarter, third quarter? We, we don't know, or at least I don't know. And, uh, you know, so that's a, a, a big kind of guiding thing. And if you, you've heard other experts saying 2023, the year of quantum, um, I know in the Midwest, so figure University of Michigan, um, some of those schools, Purdue, maybe Michigan State, they have a consortium and they have, they announced that they're going to be announcing other things, um, I think in January. So last year in 2021 was the year of partnerships, I would say, for quantum. This year is kind of working out the kinks. You know, some good results are promising. And then next year is kind of kind of that MVP, minimum viable product, or maybe a little bit before, a little bit after, you know. And there are some applications that have popped up with good results this year. Um, but in a couple days, <laughs> one, two, three, three days, uh, you know, will be a new, uh, new year for quantum. So any, anybody else, uh, anything medical or, or quantum, anybody want to talk about? And then if you had anything, Gervais, you can go ahead. Well, uh, I would just ask a question uh, just about the Josephson, jo Josephson Junction on um, building a uh, quantum computer with a uh, uh, superconductor. So how, how it works, how the Josephson Junction works? Um, that I don't know. So... A gentleman, his name's John Martinis. He's like, you know, some would consider like a, a founding uh, figure in all of this. And say he was, uh, his first paper on squids, superconducting quantum inter interface devices, their uh, quantum sensors. I believe he was even talking about Josephine Junction's back then, like in the early 80s. So you could follow his work, um, his, his publications, because I know that's been an, an area, but as far as the nuts and bolts of how exactly, you know, Josephine Junction in a quantum computer, I'm not quite sure. Oh, thank you. What's but his yeah, name again, you said? Uh, his name's John Martinis, like a martini with an S. Okay. And uh, he was, say, for instance, uh, uh, I think he was Google's quantum hardware lead in uh, 2019. So he, um, he left Google, but he's been at one of these Cali schools. I think it's UCSB, University of California, uh, Santa Barbara, uh, just churning out papers for like, say, 16 years. And there was a, I think it was an IEEE event. They interviewed him and um, he says, yeah, things are looking pretty good for quantum and you won't get any more out of them than that. So for somebody that's been in the field since, like I said, like, 83, which is his first paper, just like the month I was born, you know, he, um, he hasn't left it. So that's, that's very positive. And then now he's saying that, you know, the, um, he, he feels like it's in good hands. It, it's so much bigger in 2022 than it was, you know, say even like 10 years ago. 
And there's been other uh, kind of leaders, Salvador uh, uh, Venegas, Ian Draca. He's known as a founder of quantum computing in Mexico. So they've had quantum Latino this year. So it's very, you know, it's a very international event, even Toronto. So I was going to mention, so June 1st of this year, they uh, had a photonic uh, quantum processor that did a task in 36 microseconds instead of 9,000 years. Now, keep in mind, these aren't, uh, you know, fully functional computers. Well, I, I don't even think you can do quantum without classical because some of the gates that you actually have to measure with it, the measurement comes classically. So, you know, this whole thing of like, a uh, super quantum laptop or probably not justified, more think like a, a CPU, a GPU. Now you have a, a QPU, quantum process, processing unit. And, uh, you know, lots and lots of hybrids, those, those types of things. So I appreciate everybody coming on. Um, so this has been discussion 63, December 29th, uh, 2022. Like I said, in a couple of days, it'll be uh, 2023. Any other last questions or comments? Bahar or Gervais, go ahead. I just wanted to thank you for all the information you're giving to us. Yeah, you're welcome. And then anything else, Gervais or Tamal? Oh, I just, uh, I'm just, um, I thank you for, for, for organizing this kind of meeting. I am uh, actually the member of uh, Quantum Computer with Anna. And so I would like to attend both. <laughs> yeah, both awesome. Data. Uh, so that I can have more knowledge. And, uh, yeah, thank you for organizing this. Yeah, yeah and be best yeah. of success with that. And Tamal? Yeah, thank you for organizing this. Really, I mean, I mean, insightful in one of the most, I mean, I mean, this disease is one of the worst diseases uh, and doing some research here will, but yeah, thank you for the organizing this and really insightful session. Yeah, I uh, appreciate it. And then, um, you know, Happy New Year's, everybody. And then uh, yeah, catch Happy New Year, I'll catch you. Uh, I'll catch you guys early uh, January 2023. Have a good rest of the night and have a good upcoming weekend. Take care. Thank you. Okay, bye.